Hello, welcome. This is uh, our session today with Jeff Whiteman, um, Building a Culture of Care, contextualizing research with uh, around 900 missionaries to Orthodox clergy and church workers. Um, Jeff Whiteman is a THM and LMFT, passionate about helping people, communities connecting their life's purpose with God's mission in the world. Jeff is a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Kentucky and holds a THM in world mission and evangelism from Asbury Theological Seminary. Um, Jeff is a researcher and international speaker on the topic of miss missional resilience, together with Chris Whiteman, PhD, ABD, his wife of 18 years. They oversee the care and training of long-term missionaries at the Orthodox Christian Mission Center as mission specialists. You can find them at bit.ly backslash Whiteman family, where they have been serving in various capacities since 2007. Together with their son, Patrick, they are members of Holy Mother Queen of All Orthodox Church, uh, GOC in Lexington, Kentucky. So Jeff, I'm gonna pass it on to you and take it away. Thank you so much for uh, offering this today. Yeah, Joel, thank you so much for your introduction, and it's uh, really good to be with you all today. So I'm going to, um, I'll start with this slide. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about how do we build a culture of care in our Orthodox churches and this in our Orthodox communities. And this comes for me out of a... Um, the experience of looking at this this research with about 900 missionaries about how they had become resilient and uh, just seeing so many parallels between what they were asking for from their organizations and what uh, what I was seeing in you know what I was needing in some of the communities that I was involved in and uh, with the people that I know that work in ministry and I was just really struck there's a lot of parallels and so this is as much about having a opening up a conversation about some questions uh, than it is necessarily with giving some, some solutions. So what, uh, what I'd like to do is give you a chance to download the slides for this presentation. And uh, here's a QR code that you can scan if you'd like to. And, uh, um, or you can go to this link, bit.ly, Missio Nexus 2021. This is a presentation uh, built off of what I gave at Missio Nexus in 2021. And so, um, and so I'll give you a chance to do that. There's also a handout that you, there as well. So let me start with a, uh, what, what we'll be covering today. And uh, I'd like to kind of do three, three things with us. The first is I'd like to begin by really defining what uh, missional resilience is and how that emerged out of the research. And then second, I'd like to look at the three areas where uh, organizations can support the mission resilience of their workers. And then third, I'd like to have a discussion around how we can contextualize these findings to our orthodox context at both the diocese and the parish level. Uh, so um, as Joel said, I, uh, me and my wife, Chris, serve at the Orthodox Christian Mission Center. Um, this is a uh, this is a picture of us and our son, uh, where we primarily work in the areas of advoca advocating, coaching, and training for our long-term missionaries. Um, so, when we looked at uh, uh, this research that was done about 2018, we um, we ended up with a response that really surprised us. We, I was hoping for about um, about 100 responses to a survey and maybe talked about 10 people, interview them, write a nice article, and move on. We ended up with uh, almost 1,100 responses to the survey, and then uh, I think 250 people participated in the written interview, um, which we uh, ended up generating about 600 pages of raw data. It was an enormous amount of data um, to, uh, to be received, to steward. And as we were going through that, um, uh, if I were to kind of summarize that into like, all right, what do we learn about what does it mean to be resilient? Um, this is what I would say. Um, kind of break all that down into like 25 words. It would be this. 
we must receive Jesus's resilience to join his mission in the world. And this happens as we turn toward God, others, and ourselves for loving support. So we're take that 25, you know, all that data and break it down. What does it really mean to be resilient? It means this, we must receive Jesus's resilience to join his mission in the world. And this happens as we turn toward God, others, and ourselves for loving support. As, wow. While I was looking at kind of looking at that data, I came across this, um, this art uh, form from Japan that for me, just like absolutely captured, what does it mean to be resigned? And it's uh, it's kintsugi, and you can see um, that this piece that's been broken is uh, so to the point where it's not really like functional anymore, right? It's it's really been broken. It's repaired with gold. Um, that it's not discarded, but it's it's seen as this treasured history to be honored. And that, um, when I think about like, what does it mean to be resilient in ministry? That's, that is, I think, the best picture that I have. It means that we are um, these uh, jars of clay that have been broken by the experiences that we've had. And we are made whole with this golden love of God expressed through others. Um, and that uh, what I love about the metaphor of Kintsugi is this, is that this functional piece becomes this masterpiece, this work of art, this thing that's beautiful. I think Paul says in Galatians that, uh, that we are the, the masterpiece of the Lord. So I was, as I was looking at Kintsugi, I found myself um, in thinking about resiliency. I found myself stumbling again upon this passage out of Corinthians that to me gave me just the deep why of resilience. Um, for it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our bodies. And I, I want to share with you kind of one quote out of all of that data that I think really, really for me embodied exactly, exactly what it is that we're talking about here um, when we're talking about what it means to be resilient, which is, to me, is pretty essential for us to, in understanding how we can come alongside and support um, one another in this process. And so... This. Greater resiliency has allowed me to approach ministry with the understanding that it is not about me. God has been at work long before I ever arrived on the scene, and he will keep loving these neighbors long after I leave. I no longer view myself as essential, but as a peripheral asset to what God might be doing in the world. I just happen to tag along for the ride. This isn't to infer that I am less than important or loved by God. On the contrary, he just doesn't need me as much as I originally thought. There is a beautiful freedom and joy that emerges when one lets go to embrace this reality. I'm at peace with myself and love who I am. So let me, um, let me pause there real quick and see if you all have any thoughts or questions uh, before I, I move forward. So. Good. So when I was thinking about resilience, um, so what is this, you know, what is this kind of resiliency that we're talking about? Um, I, I think that I was struck by this, uh, by the, by the resurrection, you know, that it really is like, is there anything more resilient than Jesus's resurrection from the dead? And that our, our resiliency in ministry has to be grounded in his resurrection. Paul says in Romans, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. Is alive in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. 
And so, uh, so when we're thinking about what does it mean to be resilient, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about receiving Jesus's resilience to join him in his mission in this world as we turn toward God, others, and ourselves for loving support. Um, so we talked a little bit, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, just to make these points that, uh, that, it, that we can think about this as a kind of a three-legged stool, that our resilience really is, begins with turning toward the God who is faithful. Um, but it's not just sort of me, me and God working it out. It's, uh, we also need to turn towards others, turning toward others who are empathic and authentic. And there's a couple of things we could say about each of these, um, but we won't today for the sake of our time. But third was also that we need to also turn toward ourselves with grace. Turning toward ourselves with grace. So to summarize this kind of, you know, what is missional resilience that we're, what is it that we're talking about? It's this, we must receive Jesus's resilience to join his mission in the world. And this happens as we turn toward God others and ourselves for loving support. So as we're thinking about how do we support uh, clergy and church workers and others, um, it's important to understand, well, what are we wanting to support them towards? And I, I think this vision of missional resilience is, is that thing uh, that we want to, we, we long for in ourselves and we long to support others towards as well. So does that, let me, does that, is that tracking with you? You can give me a thumbs up if you like, or chime in with a question or comment if you want, if you have one. Um, I wonder if you're going to get to talking a little bit about more specific examples uh, a little bit later. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to kind of get us sort of 50,000 feet oriented. So yeah. Thank you. I have a question to you, Jeff. So you, you talk about relationship to God, to others, and to self. Is yes. there a place in the framework for relationship to creation as well? How does, how does that fit into this? Yeah. So those three, that's a great question, Chris. Um, thank you. Um, so those three would be kind of a summary of what, what the data showed. Mm -hmm. Um, and there was definitely a lot in creation there as well. Um, mm -hmm. and so, and I know in my own life as I've kind of like tried to live into, well, what, what do we do with this stuff? Um, you know, finding myself, uh, in, um, in creation has been really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's uh, I don't know, uh, there's some research out of Japan about forest therapy. Have you, have you seen this? I haven't. No. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and, uh, about the, like, you know, there's something there's like there in terms of resiliency, there's some, there's a real healing power to being like in, um, in creation, uh, where it's like, man, this, you know, the, the forest around me has seen, you know, uh, hundreds of years of life and we'll see hundreds of years of life. And this present moment is brought into real, real perspective mm -hmm. there. And that sense of like, yeah. And that sense of being a beloved creature in God's beloved creation is yeah so um great thank you good question so okay uh so does that kind of is that vision of sort of where we're going does that does that track i think um okay good so now we need to look at uh uh what we need to say about the organizational role in this um and here's what we here's what we did um to kind of i want to kind of to let you know where the information is coming from that I'm about to share with you. Um, we, uh, this is, cause this is the, probably the number one, it is the number one question that I've been asked is like, what do we do as an organization to help our, help our people be more resilient? Um, and, uh, and this is, and so we, we're, what we're able to do is to go into that survey into the psychographic area. There was, um, uh, a couple of questions about stressors, supports, desired resources, and what else about yourself or your experience as a missionary would you like to share? And uh, there were, I think, uh, 692 comments there. There were just open comments. And so we were able to go in and code those and analyze those. Um, and so 
Um, that's what I want to kind of talk about today with you. Um, that's, that's, uh, I think I want to stress that this was not a study directly about organizations. Um, and, uh, but that, uh, like missionaries had a lot to share about their organizations, uh, within, within the study. Um, and, uh, as I was thinking about what they had to share, I, I saw a lot of application to, uh, to other, other ministry context, which is why I wanted to kind of talk about that today with you. So, um, let me read just this, uh, um, these two points here, um, and see how this lands with you. So, uh, so it's my, uh, this is from the handout, which you can download from that slide. So, uh, it is the conviction of the authors, uh, it's the conviction of me, uh, of this study, that the correct application of these findings can inspire us to a godly grief that leads to repentance, but not to despair. Furthermore, repentance can compel us within our organizations to truly listen to our global workers, to be attuned to them, and to focus on how we can be responsive to their needs right now. But also behind these findings is a, is a really big idea. Uh, many Christian organizations, many ministry, many nonprofit organizations, many mission organizations broadly have one of three identities. Dependent organizations believe that they exist to fulfill the mission of their donors for God. Independent organizations believe that their people exist to fulfill their mission for God. And interdependent organizations believe that they exist to see God's mission fulfilled in and through the body of Christ. It's the opinion of the authors that legacy agencies that maintain organizational structures, cultures, and strategies of dependence or independence aren't inherently wrong or sinful. Before the dawn of global Christianity, it was necessary to accept the expectations attached to receiving necessary resources or to function more self-sufficiently in order to advance the Great Commission. However, we must change our organizational tack if we are to fully harness the winds that have shifted on the sea of missions in the 21st century. Organizations that continue to function dependently and or independently will become increasingly more irrelevant as they are seen as the gatekeepers to islands that the next generation of global workers simply have no interest in serving on. However, organizations that shift toward interdependence will position themselves to thrive as they harness the twin winds of one, a younger generation who have replaced institutional loyalty with hearts broken open to fight with love for the specific causes, peoples, and places, and two, a truly global church where the West now has much to receive from those we first went to missionize. It is my prayer that the Lord will grant you wisdom and courage and peace as you discern the next right steps for the organizations and the communities that you abide in to join God's mission today. Uh, so I wanted to read that as a way of introducing this kind of the, our, our through line for today and that's sort of the summary of what, what it means for us as uh, communities to come alongside and support the people with, that we serve within them towards, uh, towards receiving this missional resilience that we're talking about. And uh, that kind of summarizing line would be this. Interdependent orgs join today's church workers in God's mission in the world through love and action, training, leading, caring toward missional resilience. So interdependent orgs join today's church workers and God's mission in the world through love and action, training, leading, and caring toward missional resilience. I wasn't sure what to, how, what the quickest way or the easiest way to summarize who who I think our audience is here as we're thinking about this, and uh, and so I um, I chose church worker, um, and. Uh, because I, I, as I, you know, as I interact with, uh, with people in ministry and lay ministry and vocational ministry, I'm struck by that, that like, um, you know, like, uh, presbyteras in their parishes, uh, face real challenges, um, as do, uh, as do clergy 
you know, and real opportunities as to clergy. Uh, there's, uh, um, so there, there's, so I went with the word church worker to kind of try to try to capture that. Okay, so let, um, so we looked at all of these comments about stressor supports desired resources, and we broke it and coded it around organizations and broke it down into these three areas of, uh, of really about love and action expressed in training, leading, and caring uh, toward this missional resilience, this Jesus's resilience that we've been speaking about. So let me, uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk through uh, each of these three areas, and then I'd like to talk about our application to uh, to our church. So um, let me let me pause. We've had a couple of uh, folks join us today, um, and so let me just give give a chance for you all to um, to just let me know kind of why why you're here today, and then I'll I'll be able to target my 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 comments moving forward to your to what you have to say. So if you want to just uh, unmute yourself and just say a little, little bit about why you're here today, that, that would be great. Well, I can start. I'm here because I've heard a little bit about this research. Um, actually, I went to one of Jeff's presentations in New Jersey about three years ago. And uh, I don't, I think the research hadn't even been done yet. Uh, no, I think he did have some of it done yet. It was yeah. just just beautiful. So I was just excited to kind of hear another layer of this amazing research. Thank you, Joel. Hi, um, I just joined in and uh, this is my first co-camper conference. So I am... Hey, um, sorry, joining from home and I have a... Uh, 10 month old. So I'm a little, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, this is my first Ocamper conference. And uh, to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about uh, your research, uh, but I, I am very interested in, you know, what everybody has to offer. I mean, it, there's been so many different things that I've, uh, I've already seen and heard about. And so I'm, uh, uh, you know, smoking it all in. Right. It's just great to awesome. get out of my own little head and see what other people are doing. Thank you, James. So. Okay, good. Um, thank you all. That is helpful. All right. So let me, let me kind of, uh, we'll continue on here. And uh, okay. So, uh, training. We can summarize uh, everything that was shared about the training in uh, in this um, kind of this summary. Uh, um, whole person across the career span for sustainable, impactful life and ministry. And we're gonna we're gonna use this rowing metaphor throughout. Um, and uh, I really like the, the I, this image of the equipment as the training that really, you know, that training that supports uh, our work together uh, in, uh, in pursuing this mission that we've been given. So, um, so there are a couple of comments we can make about the training uh, that people reported. Um, and I think relates pretty dramatically to our um, to our churches and to our Orthodox communities. Uh, the first is that the number one concern the global workers shared in the comments was about insufficient training or a need for more training. Uh, 39% of comments um, were about this, about the need for more training. Um, and those that need for more training fell into two categories. The first was uh, content. Uh, and uh, there were four broad areas that people were looking for more, more training in. The first was relationship skills. The number one was skills and communication uh, about uh, num number uh, constructive conflict. I'm going to pause here and uh, I'm using a kind of a technical term there. So I'm a marriage and family counselor. And we talk a lot about how there's, there's really two types of conflict. There's uh, destructive conflict and there is um, constructive conflict. 
there's destructive conflict and there's constructive conflict. And so this, it, there's the skills in constructive conflict, team dynamics, coaching, mentoring others, um, things like that. Uh, there was also a huge need for cultural skills. The number one was ethnography. Ethnography is the lenses that we put on, the glasses we put on to see another culture, to see another person, to see another people, to understand. Um, and that need for ethnography is not something that is uh, um, just something that uh, you know people who who move cross culturally need. Uh, I'm watching I'm watching so many of my you know the people that I know uh, go through these these processes of deconstructing their faith, um, and so much of that is a real like it's a real cultural encounter that they're having. Their the faith that they had isn't answering the questions that they have. You know, they, there's a, a need for ethnography, learning the language, difficult cultural differences, things like that. The third was practical living and ministry skills, um, things from finances to raising support to uh, cult, um, to uh, the needs of their family and their children, re-entering retirement, security, stress and time management, transition, how to counsel others how to approach ministry in ways that are sustainable and avoid dependency. There's also a real longing for uh, soul care skills, things like spiritual formation, theology and missiology, grief and loss, spiritual warfare, mental health, especially how to recognize and respond to trauma and anxiety. And as I was looking at that list of the areas where um, missionaries are asking for more training, I was struck by how I think I don't know of anyone working in ministry that doesn't uh, doesn't long for more training in those areas. There was also the uh, the issue of um, uh, the process of how that training was delivered, and I think an important thing for missionaries, and I think it's true uh, for anyone working in ministry in the kind of ministry career span, is that what it takes to get to stay, lead, and leave is radically different. It's radically different, and. Um, Again and again, we saw people asking for training that reflected their changing needs. Um, and specifically in a way that I would say is um, a whole person discipleship that forms their head and their hands and their heart and their health. So let me share with you a couple of the quotes that, uh, um, that people shared that kind of to put a little bit of flesh onto this. Um, having well-rounded personal, cultural, and spiritual preparation before leaving for the field was extremely helpful. While no one can predict everything that will happen, I felt extremely prepared to navigate even unexpected challenges. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, for the sake of our time, I want to skip to this one. And uh, you can... Uh, Go and download the slides and read, read them more if you'd like to. So uh, as a trainer of long-term missionaries, I have found that there is um, that it is not only the content, the subject matter that's important, but also the training methodology. The most effective training is done in community with other missionaries at similar life stages, often in learning cohorts where sharing and learning from others is an important part of learning and growing process. And then... Uh, uh, this, this final one, it has been quite the journey. When I went to the field as a single young 20 something, I had no clue about things like cultural stress, grief, trauma, secondary trauma, burnout, etc. I suspect many people who work in ministry could, could resonate with that. After 10 years on the field, I just participated in a debriefing retreat about a month ago. I just kept thinking about how I wish I would have known about something like that eight plus years ago. Mental health of missionaries, self-care, resiliency, and the like are so important to me now, critical really. I have spent the last few years learning more about the areas of grief and trauma because I believe that missionaries must be supported in the areas in these areas in order to continue in their calling. As I've been... Um, 
kind of reflecting on this area of training. Uh, that, that issue of calling and being equipped for calling has been something that's been really on my mind a lot. That um, uh, we see that in so much in the biblical narrative of people who are called, <laughs> that calling is confirmed, and they're equipped for that calling. Think about St. Paul um, and his, the 13 years that he spent between the road, between his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus and his encounter with the apostles in Jerusalem. All that time that he spent being equipped um, and uh, one of the, for that calling that he had. So I've, uh, that's been one of the things that I've really been wrestling with um, is do we have a misunderstanding that conflates calling with equipping um, for ministry? And how does that, and that leads us to not, not do all that we can to train, to train well our workers. And I wonder the same thing in our churches and in our other, and in our Orthodox communities. Okay. So we've talked about um, training the whole person across the career span for sustainable, impactful life and ministry. Let me um, just pause and see if you have any thoughts or questions, and then we will um, move on to uh, leading with that, what we have, what we can say about that. So, okay. So we've suggested to you that uh, interdependent orgs join today's church workers and God's mission in the world to love in action, training, leading, and caring toward missional resilience. Uh, so we've talked about training. Let's talk a little bit about leading. Um, and this, this is uh, one that's actually probably the, one of the more challenging ones to talk about. Um, but uh, but we'll, we, uh, I, I will be, I'll share, you, I will share with you what we learned. So leading came down to these three qualities, uh, broadly, competent, caring, and collaborative. And so there were... Um, Again, I, it's worth reminding everyone that this is not a study of organizations. <laughs> it's just, it's asking uh, missionaries about their experience of uh, becoming resilient, who was helpful, what that looked like. And, uh, I, but it was still pretty, pretty surprising to see that there were a total of six positive comments specific about leadership. In fact, one in four people mentioned leader, leadership that, um, where they desired more support than they were getting. Um, there were three broad ways in which leadership seemed to miss the mark for people. Um, the first was uh, corrupt leadership that was actively harmful. 28.5% um, of comments about leadership fell in, into this, this, this area. Uh, the number two was destructive conflict with, within the organization. Um, people talking about spiritual abuse and being treated unfairly or badly or toxic. Um, the unrepentant sin or unacknowledged woundedness of leaders. Um, the second was incompetent leadership that, that passively harmed. 33.5% of comments fell into this category. Um, one was structures that just don't serve. Poorly defined roles, politics within the organization, Corporate culture, structure, strategies that were misapplied to ministry, untrained, unprepared by leaders, inadequate, no oversight. Another was uh, incompetent leadership also included expectations that can't be met, unrealistic, unclear expectations. That was number three, uh, feeling overworked by leadership. And the third was untrustworthy leadership. And I'm, I made a, the judgment call here to put untrustworthy leadership in, in the area of incompetence because I, I know a lot of people in ministry in roles of leadership. I don't know any of them that set out to be untrustworthy. I know that many of them find themselves in situations that are complex <laughs> with, uh, with uh, uh, very diverse stakeholders and they don't necessarily know how to manage all of that. Um, 
but uh, so I, I made that, that was kind of a judgment call on my part. The third area was a uh, negligent leadership that simply missed the good. And this was the most dominant 38%. The number one was a lack of support, inadequate support, especially preemptive care, inadequate support in times of crisis or struggle, lack of mentoring. A second was a lack of input, disempowerment was number four, not being listened to, believed, lack of communication, lack of options in the decision. I, um, I will say in like seeing that in the, in the data, uh, I have found myself often coming, you know, as I'm talking with our global workers, um, apologizing for ways that I've not um, reached out and uh, been as supportive to them as I could. Cause I, I see that in the data. And that's been one of the things I've wanted to take away from this is wanting to, um, to in, in the power that I have, uh, to be as supportive as I can to the people that that are that are within our care within our org, um, and to ask them how you know what ask for their input. What what can we be doing better and different to be supportive, caring for you? Um, so and those those have been um, some really fruitful conversations. So let me um, and I hope that God will grant us more of them. So. Let me share with you a couple of the quotes that I think really sort of capture what we're, what we're talking about here. So um, uh, when my wife ha and I had a very difficult season five years into our field ministry, our mission team helped us tremendously. Without their wise intervention and loving support, we might not have continued on the field. I have had the privilege of working with an amazing team of leaders. So those are two of the, the positive comments about leadership. Here are a couple of the, um, the negative ones. I developed a disability while serving and presented a, to me, very viable option for how I could serve my final term and was not listened to and essentially told there was no place in missions for someone with a disability. There was no outlet for me as a single woman to voice concerns about unethical practices. I had to leave and receive counseling for PTSD. The main reason for returning home was a lack of definition around my role. It was so very vague. I felt stranded and abandoned by my mission. Stressors was seeming constant change in expectations from the organization. Our org was ill-equipped and near non-existent in aiding us, and the finances were a mess on their end, i.e. in an emergency, we, had, we were not given the advance needed and approved. So we're talking about um, the ways in which uh, leadership can, uh, misses the mark with organizations. I think for me, there's um, the questions around this uh, that this has raised are, um, are a couple. One is uh, in our globalized world, mission organ I would say nonprofit organizations are no longer the gatekeepers to uh, church workers joining God's mission. So for example, if I, if I felt the Lord putting on my heart that I needed to go and work with Afghan refugees, I could go and find um, a group of Afghan refugees at a military base within a drive, you know, within a few hours drive from my home. Um, so uh, organizations don't serve as gatekeepers anymore in the way that they did. This reality is compounded by the 21st century uh, our workers who no longer have institutional loyalty. Uh, people fight for the causes and the people and the places that their hearts are broken open for, not for the institutions they serve. That's really clear. Um, so what can organizations reasonably expect to happen if they continue to fail to lead their workers toward receiving missional resilience to join God's mission? Um, certainly right now in the midst of this pandemic, Gallup just put out a report on the state of the global workforce in 2021, and they found that among those who are uh, who are actively disengaged from their jobs, 75% are actively looking for new work. Actively looking for new work right now. Engagement, not pay or perks, is the leading indicator and the chief reason 
for the record turnover many companies are experiencing today. But how about not just right now in the midst of this pandemic, how about in 10 or 30 years when everyone currently serving has retired? The other question this really raises for me is this. Um, so we talk in um, kind of systems counseling about homeostasis, about the ways in which um, uh, uh, human systems tend to get stuck and continue to perpetuate these organizational cultures, structures, and strategies that are no longer may be effective. Um, when you're in an organization, you often describe this as like, we're like a really large ship that turns slowly. So that's homeostasis. Uh, but healthy innovation disrupts the system and leads to a, no, a new homeostasis in the organizational culture and the structure and the strategy. I think one of the questions we need to ask ourselves in our organizations is what are going to be the indicators that our innovation has led to a healthier system homeostasis? We're going to get stuck in, in ruts. We want to get stuck in new ruts, in the right ruts. So let me, uh, let me pause there and see if you all have any thoughts, questions, or comments, and then we'll move forward. Anything I can clarify in that? Okay, so we're talking about um, this uh, interdependent organizations joining today's church workers and God's mission in the world through love and action, training, leading, and caring toward missional resilience. So let's talk about, we've talked about training, we've talked about leading, let's talk a little bit about care. So care is, uh, when we looked at what uh, people were asking for in terms of care, it was preemptive, responsive, and networked. Of the 427 comments about support, 170, 39.8% of them related to people's relationship with God. We could say that the vast majority, 92% of comments about support came from outside the organization and a turning toward God, others, and oneself for loving support. The comments that directly mentioned support from the organization, there were only 18 of them, uh, involved preemptive member care, uh, mentor coaching, or spiritual direction. I think that it's really helpful for us to think about this in terms of a matrix of control and a matrix of responsibility. So, um, if a missionary experience, if you know somebody experiences something traumatic in their in their ministry, uh, we don't have we we unlikely have control over that, uh, but I think we do have responsibility to ensuring that they receive the appropriate care, support, counseling, debriefing, and things of that nature. Does that make sense? Um, and uh, perhaps you know we people receive care and support from their relationship with God, their relationship with others, their relationship with themselves. But a lot of that's outside of our control, but it's not outside of our responsibility. So, which leads to this idea that uh, we have an essential but a tertiary role to play in supporting global workers toward receiving missional resilience. I'm going to skip some of these quotes um, and I want to talk about this video. I think because we're going to, this is going to be on YouTube. I'm not going to show it. I think it would, it'll get censored if we do that. So I'm Jeff, just going to... Jeff, I just wanted to tell you, we've got about, um, about nine minutes left. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Okay. So, cause I think this really captures the, uh, the heart of what I'm proposing to you as our organizational role is what we can do as a community. So um, Derek, and I'm, let me describe this to you. You can, there's a link, you can download a copy of these slides and you can play it yourself. Um, you can also Google Derek Redman, Barcelona, 1992 Olympics. Um, so Derek Redman is a, uh, is running, I think he's like the 400 meter dash. He's favored to win. And um, 
halfway into it, he uh, he pulls his hamstring and he, he falls to the ground. Um, and you see like, you know, I mean, the agony and the pain, but also like the shattered dreams that he has. And, uh, and so he um, decides to get up and to hobble across the finish line. And um, you see uh, this, this, you know, this man run out from the stands. Um, and there are all these officials trying to like push him away, push him back, stop him. And, and he's not going to stop. And he, he gets to, to Derek and he puts his arm around him and he says, you know, son, do you want to finish the race? And he says, like, and he's like, yeah, dad, I want to finish the race. He's like, all right, let's do it. And so they walk together across that finish line. And when I think about what does it mean to have this essential but tertiary role as an organization in the lives of our workers, I think this is what it means. That we stand alongside them. That we're in the stands, we're cheering for them. Think about all the ways that his dad was involved in his training and his leading and his care to get to that moment. You know, and so in that moment, he, uh, he runs out from the stance and he joins. His son. And I, and that's when I think about what does it mean for us to have, uh, to be supportive? I think that's what it is. It's, it's that, uh, being in the stands with the father's heart. So let me pause there and see, uh, how any of how this is resonating with you, what you're thinking about. And then I want to share with you in the few minutes we have what might be uh, a way forward with this. So I'll pause and see if this has stirred anything for you. I was just thinking about how there's this, this beautiful picture of theosis that the Orthodox church has um, and how this just fits in uh, so well. I'm just, I would just love to see more about the vocation of the Orthodox caregiver and not as a functional role of caregiving, but the whole process of being a healer, being part of the healing ministry of uh, the body of Christ, being a way towards knowing self, knowing others, knowing God, um, and this journey of theosis. And I, I think some of the things you're talking about just fall right into line with that, that idea. I love that. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, I've, I've often thought that, um, you know, reinstu- reinstating the uh, uh, female diaconate is a natural way of the church being able to, to bless and support and honor and um, uh, this, this healing work that the Lord has given so many people to do in the world. Um, and for the church to be like, yes, amen, oxios. So, um, and it would be, it would be good to see, to see more of that. Yeah. Thanks. So. Uh, so we're at about five minutes here. So I want to make sure you get, get in what you want to get in. Any other comments or thoughts, anything else that's resonant for you as we kind of bring our time to a close? Okay, so let me um, share with you a, uh, what I think is one way that we, of what we can do with this. Um, this research in our organizations, in our communities, in our, I would, in our diocese. Um, and that is uh, a process that I would say uh, to craft what I'm going to call um, uh, TLC goals. So training, leading, and care goals. Um, and I've thought about this. This isn't the only way to do this, um, but I do think this, this uh, is one way for us as as communities to create a culture of care. Um, because the most important thing I think is for us is that we actually go and listen to our people, you know, listen to our people. And so the first step is when we're ready to really truly listen for input, uh, we ask, we ask our people how they're doing and what they're needing. I, my recommendation is to do this with an outside entity who can kind of create that audit. I don't think most 
people in leadership would benefit from seeing uh, the raw data and uh, soliciting raw data doesn't create an anonymous you know, feedback mechanism. So I don't think you'd really get accurate information that way. So get an outside entity and step one, when we're ready um, to truly listen, ask for input. Then step two, set aside some time for prayer, for fasting, for rejoicing and repenting and seeking the Lord and how we can best steward the resources of the people that he's entrusted to us to move forward in joining his work in this world. So set aside a time for that. And then focus on what can we do right now? And what might we try to do next? And by right now, I mean like right now, like this quarter, these next 12 weeks, immediately, what can we do? Especially in the areas of training, leading, and care. And those, those can become our TLC goals, training, leading, and care goals. And imagine if, uh, um, if you did that as a community, you know, imagine if you, know, you work in the church and uh, the person above you reached out to you and asked and solicited this kind of input from you and was able to deliver to you these kinds of like, hey, here's, here's some things we can do right now. Uh, in 12 months, if you do that every quarter, you'd have delivered 12 things. Uh, you would really have momentum as a community, for sure. Um, and in 10 years, uh, you'd have 120 TLC accomplishments under your belt. Uh, you would be a different community. You would be a resilient missional community. And so, uh, so go back and ask people, uh, you know, maybe in six months, maybe in a year, how are you doing? What are you needing? Again, repeat the process. Take some time to pray, to fast, to seek the Lord, to rejoice in what can be rejoiced in, and to honestly repent over what can be repented of. Um, and, uh, and seek the Lord. Um, I think there are other ways for us to become, uh, to, be, to cultivate a community of care. But I know that um, for a lot of us, uh, if, our, if our churches, if our dioceses, if our organizations could do that, um, it would go a long ways to providing that, that kind of care that we need in this, this time. And I think that it's in our best interest as communities to do that, as well as in the best interest of the people who we serve and in fidelity to the gospel. So that's my simple idea. Um, and uh, we've got a minute if anyone has any thoughts or questions, and I'd like to pray and say good night to you all. So. So let me, um, okay. Well, before you pray, Jeff, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Ocamper for preparing this for us. And um, just thank you again, as always, uh, bringing this uh, very relevant data to help us rethink how we can be more effective and what we do. Thank you, Joel. Um, oh, I... Here, here are two books that I found pretty helpful as I've been thinking about this. One is uh, The Dance of We, uh, and it's the uh, looking at um, the dynamics of power and love in our human relation systems and uh, our need for kind of mindfulness in that. It's, that's a really good book. And this is a newer book that's come out. I think it's uh, helpful as well, which is a church called Tove. Tove is the Hebrew word that you find in the creation narrative when God says, it is good. He's saying it is Tov. Uh, so this is about kind of confronting toxic, toxic culture and building a goodness culture in our, in our communities. Um, if you'd like a couple of the slides from today, and you can go, you can scan, get your phone, and you can uh, scan that QR code. You can also type in uh, bit.ly Missio Nexus 2021. I, uh, I am preparing for a marathon tomorrow and my wife has surgery on Thursday. And so I uh, was not able to make a separate landing page for today for you all. So, um, okay. So let me uh, thank you all again. And it would be okay. Let me take a second and close in prayer for us. So in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit, amen. Oh, heavenly King, the comfort of the spirit of truth. 
who art everywhere present, who fills all things, treasure of blessings and giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us from all impurity and save our souls, O good one. Lord Jesus, we um, long to receive your resilience and to join you in your work in this world and uh, to, for your resurrection life to be alive in us. Lord, to face the challenges that we face in ways that bring you glory. And Lord, we long to be communities that cultivate a culture of care, that embody your gospel, that truly do love one another. And so we ask that you, you would do that work in us, that you would give us an intention for it, that you would show us the way, and that you'd grant us to be resilient missional communities for the purposes of your work in this world. Our world desperately needs to see communities of care, it needs to be embodied in communities of care. And so we ask that you would do that. We pray all these things knowing that you are good and you truly do love us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right.